Good morning and welcome to our service this morning. We have been very fortunate to have the Reverend Douglas Clark with us here at St Mary's over the past few weeks and I would like to express our sincere thanks to Douglas as he leads us in our worship once again this morning. And as we prepare for worship, let's turn to today's thought for prayer. Let us pray. I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come mine aid. My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth hath made. Lord, we lift our eyes to the hills which remind us of your steadfast love and care. Maker of heaven and earth, keep us safe in the knowledge that wherever we are in our lives, the lives of our families, the life of the church, and the life of the world, you will sustain us at all times. The psalmist assures us that you will neither slumber nor sleep. Keeper of our souls, as the Campsie Fells remind us of your presence and faithfulness, throughout life and beyond, we offer you now ourselves, just as we are, and put all our trust in you each day and each night. Draw near, Lord, to all those who feel insecure, afraid or alone. May our prayers bring them peace, and your love bring them comfort and healing. Amen. Good morning. I hope you're all well and with the restrictions easing just a little bit, you're beginning to enjoy life a little bit more. It has been a pleasure for me to conduct worship here in this church the past five weeks and I wish you well in your future. I must say though it's been strange conducting worship in an empty church and I think we all hope that these days will come to an end very soon. We'll just need to wait and see. The psalmist said, sing to the Lord all the world, worship the Lord with joy, come before him with happy songs, acknowledge that the Lord is God, he made us and we belong to him, we are his people, we are his flock, enter the temple gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise him. The Lord is good, his love is eternal, and his faithfulness lasts forever. Let us worship God and sing to his praise and glory the hymn number 200, Christ is made the sure foundation.
words of God are true and all his works are dependable. He loves what is righteous and just. His constant love fills the earth. Let us pray. Lord of the morning and all our days and nights, we gather to praise you this new day. We praise you for your gifts and your care. You are the maker of all we see and know, giver of all good gifts and lover of us all. You are the friend in all our lives, reaching out your hand to the stranger to embrace with strength and hope. Lord of the morning and all our days and nights, we gather to praise you on this new day. This day, as all days, loving God, is the day to worship you. Turn us to the light and warmth of your presence, that in confidence we may come to you and confess all that we've done that is wrong. So we knock at your gate with our prayers and confess that our lives and the life of the world are broken apart and much of it is our fault. So we ask to be forgiven and as we open the door to peace we ask to be renewed and this we ask in Jesus name who taught us to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us hear the word of God reading from the scriptures of the New Testament from the Gospels, the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Matthew's Gospel at chapter 13 and reading verses 31 to 33 and verses 44 to 52. And these were read by Jean McLean. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man takes a mustard seed and sows it in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it grows up, it is the biggest of all plants. It becomes a tree, so that birds come and make their nests in its branches. Jesus told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A woman takes some yeast and makes, mixes it with 40 litres of flour until the whole batch of dough rises. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field. He covers it up again and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and then goes back and buys that field. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man is looking for fine pearls and when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. Some fishermen throw their net out in the lake and catch all kinds of fish. When the net is full, they pull it to shore and sit down to divide the fish. The good ones go into their buckets. The worthless ones are thrown away. It will be like this at the end of the age. The angels will go out and gather up the evil people from among the good and will throw them into the fiery furnace, where they will cry and grind their teeth. Do you understand these things? Jesus asked them. Yes, they answered. So he replied, This means then that every teacher of the law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who takes new and old things out of his storeroom. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in your sight, Lord God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. It's a simple question. Is it worth it? Is the payoff worth the cost? 
Is the potential reward worth the risk? We face that all the time for the simple reason that everything has a cost. Nothing is free. Even gifts come with some kind of strings attached. When our boys were quite young, they had been lobbying quite persistently for an addition to our family. It was one of the four-legged variety. They wanted a dog. I told them a dog would cost a lot of money. No, it wouldn't, Dad. It's free. I said, how do you work that out? Dogs are not free. Then they explained to me that they'd saved up their pocket money and they would give me the money for the dog. So it wouldn't cost me anything and therefore it was free. And in their sight, I suppose it was free. I had to explain to them that there's no such thing as a free dog. First of all, you've got to take it to the vet for its injections. Then there's the cost of a lead and a collar, a basket for it to sleep in, and all the ongoing costs of food plus the work of walking it and caring for it. Not to mention a new couch to replace the one that got eaten. Is it worth it? Well, if you're a dog lover, perhaps it is. But it's certainly not free. This question of cost and value, of risk and reward, applies to every aspect of life. It controls minor decisions like, is it worth it to enroll the children for swimming lessons? And it's part of our major decisions as well. Is it worth it to uproot your family and move to another area or another country to a new career opportunity? We're constantly having to ask ourselves whether the things we are seeking are worth giving up. Whether that cost is time or money or freedom or perhaps something else. Every one of you had a choice this morning. You could have spent the morning tidying up the garden. You could be sitting at home with the Sunday papers and a cup of coffee. And maybe that's exactly what you're doing. There are dozens of things to do on a Sunday. And maybe you're watching this service later on in the day or later on in the week. Yet you've tuned into this service and I'm thankful for that. You're doing that because for whatever reason you believe it's worth it. Whether it's because of the music, the preaching, the fact that you feel part of this church, even in these difficult times. You know, like everything else, Christian life involves costs and benefits. And we're constantly facing the question of whether it's worth it. Many people say, no, it is not. I don't need religion. I like my life just the way it is. I have no need for the church. Of course, we need to count the cost, but we also need to consider the reward. The kingdom of heaven is like this. A man happens to find a treasure hidden in a field and he's so happy he goes and sells everything he has and then goes back and buys the field. First of all, this parable is not about the man's ethics. Was it morally right for him to buy the field without telling the owner what he had found? Doesn't matter. The parable isn't about that. It's about the great value of the treasure and what the man was willing to do to obtain it. The kingdom is worth more than the cost of discipleship and those who know where the treasure lies joyfully abandon everything to secure it. And the second detail, why was the treasure buried? Well, because in first century Palestine, there were no banks, no safe deposit boxes. If you had treasure to keep safe, the best thing to do would be to hide it in the ground. Now, the treasure was hidden. 
It could be that hundreds of people walked past it every day. There would be people who were so incredibly close to this incredible wealth and they never knew it. Would you believe that that very thing happens today? Hundreds of people many of them that you know personally walk past an incredible wealth every day and they don't realize it people walk past this church and many other churches every day including a sunday and they've no idea of the incredible wealth that's in here a treasure that could change their lives forever. And I feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for them because I don't know if they realize that this is not a dress rehearsal for the real thing. This is the only life that we have. We don't get another chance at it. And hundreds, millions of people all over the country are refusing the opportunity to discover a treasure of great price. If you miss it, then you miss it. So what could be more important than finding this treasure? Apparently in season quite a lot of things. So how do we help these people discover this treasure that they're missing? Well, we don't. They have to find it for themselves. But then if everyone understood the gospel and believed it to be true, then church membership would increase. The streets would be empty on a Sunday morning. Every church would be filled to overflowing. And football matches would have to be cancelled on a Sunday. But that doesn't happen. It doesn't happen because the treasure is hidden. People can't see it. Now it's not that it hasn't been revealed and proclaimed and preached because it has. People can't see it unless God gives them sight. People are naturally blind to the truth. That's what Jesus meant when he made this statement. The disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to people in parables? And he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. And this is why I speak to them in parables. Jesus spoke to them in parables so they could understand. To make it simple for them, it was everyday stuff he was talking about things they were familiar with the value of the kingdom is hidden you see the value of the kingdom is hidden because for now for now it's mainly internal it can't be seen it can't be seen because it's a change that takes place in the heart it's a process of inner transformation in which we become more and more Christ-like. It has to do with things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Of course, the effects of these changes can be seen, but the process of change itself is invisible. The value of the kingdom is, heaven, is, of heaven, is hidden because its ultimate fulfillment is in the future. It's hidden for now. Now, this treasure is of immense value. We are not given a cash amount to be all we know is that when the man finds it, 
he realizes that he's stumbled upon a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. He immediately goes and sells everything he has in exchange for it. I'm sure you're familiar with the television series called Antiques Roadshow. People bring their antiques. An expert examines them and tells them what they're worth. The highlight of every show is when someone brings in a beat-up old piece of furniture and the expert tells them it's a rare historical artifact worth somewhere in the region of £50,000. Everyone cheers. Everyone's happy. And I got it for a fiver at a jumble sale, they'll say. This show is popular because it taps into everyone's fantasy. Buying an old painting at a sale room, taking it out of the frame and finding a long lost masterpiece by Van Gogh underneath. We just love, we just love the idea of finding hidden treasure and buying it, buying it for a fraction of its value. That was the attitude of the man in this parable. He sold all he had, and he was glad to do it. He saw it as a bargain. He wasn't reluctant to part with his belongings. He did it because he knew. He knew that he was getting something far greater in return. Could we do that? Could we do that very thing? I mean, would we be not only willing, but glad, even joyful, to give or our all for Christ. Do we regard the present benefits and the future rewards of knowing Christ to be so great that we have no hesitation of giving freely of ourselves? Do we see that as a small sacrifice or no sacrifice when Christ asks us to do something for him or give something to him? Paul said, I consider it a loss compared to the surpassing great, the greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, who for his sake I've lost all things. God's watching. He sees every act of self-denial, hears every word spoken in love, sees every act of service and sacrifice, and at the proper time he'll reward us, far beyond anything we can imagine. No matter how you're called to serve, or suffer, or sacrifice, it will be worth it, and far more. There's a treasure waiting at the end of the day. Let me close by saying this. Maybe you've been called on to suffer, to give, to serve, and maybe it has been in ways that stretch you to the limits. And sometimes you wonder, not only how can you keep on trusting and serving God with all the stuff that's going on in your life, at times you wonder if God sees, if God cares. Many times our spiritual victories and our spiritual defeats are played out on a relatively small stage. And the only characters involved are you, and sometimes only you. And the struggle is entirely internal. You just battle away with it. Does it really matter what you do when no one else knows about your struggles? when no one else sees what's going on but you? Well, let me tell you, yes, yes, it does matter. God sees and God cares. It matters to him more than you will ever, ever know. Every act of faith and obedience, even if it's unseen and unknown by others, every act of faith and obedience will be rewarded and honoured at the proper time. So is it worth it? You bet. 
is well worth it and you'll never regret it. I can guarantee it. Let us pray. God of all life, encircle us with the sweetness and strength of your mercy that we may choose the way of Jesus. Protect all who tread the path of service in your name. May courage be their companion and wisdom their guide. And may each one of us journey with the risen Christ. Amen. This is the hymn 352, All oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
let us pray. Father, in all that we say and do during this week, may we know the freshness of your love and the security of your hold upon us. And as we bring this offering, take it and use it, not according to our narrow vision, but according to your eternal wisdom. Lord God, sometimes it's hard to find new reserves and fresh inspiration to try and try again when we've given our all and believe that we've achieved something, when we've kept on battling despite the obstacles in our way, it hurts to accept that there are still more hurdles to face, more setbacks to overcome. Yet though we may sometimes feel weary at the demands, we know in our hearts that life is made of such challenges and that no achievement, however special, is sufficient to answer all our dreams. Renew us through your Holy Spirit and give us the faith and commitment to walk in your way. Loving God, we thank you for your love, a love which continues to reach out to us no matter what. We thank you for the love of family and friends which supports us and helps us to get through our difficult times. We thank you for the love of Christian fellowship, which encourages us and leads us towards your kingdom. We bring to your love, Lord God, the daily work of each member of Christ's body, that in constant prayer we may learn your will and your way of doing things. We bring to you, love, the mistakes and short-sightedness and arrogance of our world, that in Christ we may learn to respect one another. We bring to you, love, the hurt, the despairing and the rejected, that they may find Christ suffering alongside them. We bring to you, love, our busy concerns with unimportant things that in spending more time in Christ's company we may learn to act and react with the character of Jesus. Father, we ask you to ease the burdens of those bowed down by bereavement, depression and pain. Those struggling to live just another day. Refresh them and walk with them. We pray for the work of your church in suburbs, cities and villages all over the world, that all who work in your name may be blessed and encouraged and that they may find peace in your love. Father, take the suffering and comfort them. Take the frightened and reassure them. Take the lonely and befriend them. Take the dying and whisper peace to them. Take the dead and welcome them. Take those who mourn and walk with them. And we bring to you all the concerns of your people regarding this virus which sweeps the world, bring calm and healing. And we pray for all who work to ease our burdens. God our Father, we ask you to accept our prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sing the hymn 459. Crown him with many crowns.
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and all whom you love this day and forevermore. Amen.